2019, paper number one, let's get straight into it. Um, so here they're just saying there's a quadratic that goes to this point as a turning point of this. Now, a turning point I can write as this, where the turning point is A, B. Um, and I've put a K in front of here because I don't know whether the quadratic is upside down or whether it's stretched more vertically, but I know the turning point of this is AB, but I've put a K in there and I need to find out K as well. But that's fine because apparently the turning point is minus one, three. So A is, is minus one um, and B is three. So that's fine. I know now that it goes through one minus one and all I'm looking for is K. So let's put in Y is minus one and X is one. Um, and we get this and we get that K is minus one, which is what I wanted. Um, so now I know my full uh, expression is y equals minus uh, this thing here. And of course, that's not one of the answers, but I can expand it out um, and, and get my answer of a. Excellent. Number two, um, find the set of values for which this is positive. Now, if I were to draw that, I guess, so first I'll call the function this thing. I've also grouped the x's together and the constants together. Uh, if, if it's positive, then it means it has no roots, right? This is some kind of quadratic that sits above the x-axis at all times. Um, which means, of course, the discriminant is less than zero, which means that b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, a is one, b is this, c is that. Put that into here, uh, expand it out carefully, make sure you don't mess up these negative negatives here, collect it together, factorize, and now this is a new quadratic with solutions or roots at zero and minus 12, uh, and it's less than zero between minus 12 and zero, uh, which is somewhere in here, uh, that answer there. A again. Uh, number three, so... Anything to the power of zero is just one. So this gives us no x's. Or I need to sum up how many x's I have. This gives me no x's because anything to the power of zero is just one. This here clearly gives me one x. This is just one plus x. Now this, if you were to expand it, becomes one plus two x plus x squared. And this becomes one plus three x plus three x squared plus x cubed. And essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to get no x from here, one from there, two from there, three from there, four from and so on, 79 x's from there and 80 x's from there. And so all I have to do when I add up all the x's is do 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 80. Um, now, if you don't know how to add up integers very quickly, I think I have a video on this channel that talks about it. Um, but essentially, if you're adding up consecutive integers starting at 1, you just take the last one times it by its next number and divide by 2. Again, uh, maybe, maybe look up a video to explain that. Um, I think there is one on my channel. You just figure this out and you get the answer. Nice. Question number 4. Um, I'm going to rewrite this firstly as x to the n to the half, um, just because I can see the answer is in powers, so I'm going to make this a power. Now x2 is 10 to the half, clearly, it's just root 10. x3 is 10 to the half to the half, because it's root 10 rooted, uh, which is 10 to the quarter, of course, you multiply the powers. x to the 4 is 10 to the quarter to the half, which makes x to the 8, 10 to the 8th x to the 5 is 10 to the 8th to the half, which makes 10 to the 16th. And I'll stop there, because I think we can see a pattern here, which is, well, a half I can write as minus 2. Um, sorry, that's not completely, it's completely wrong. I can write it as 2 to the power minus 1, uh, because 2 to the power minus 1 is a half. Um, now, a quarter is 1 over 2 squared, which means I can therefore write it as 2 to the power minus 2. An eighth is 1 over 2 cubed, so I can write it as 2 to the power minus 3. And a sixteenth, likewise. And you notice the relationship between the x, 5, and the 2 to the power minus 4, 4, 3, 3, 2, 2, 1. This number is always 1 bigger than that number. So x to the 100 um, is going to be 10 to the 2 to the minus 99. Number 5. Um, yeah, I think the way that I did this is really beautiful. I'm just, just saying. Um, this is a geometric series. You multiply by R to move to the next term. And it's saying the sum of the first six terms of this, I think I've written out the first five there, but the sum of the first six is equal to nine times the sum of the first three. Now, you could use uh, this formula if you wanted to, but I'm not going to. I've also been told that the seventh term, which is this one here, is 360. Um I did use this formula and it ended up working, but then I figured out there was an even better way to do it, which is just to write the first six terms added up equal nine times the first three terms. So just ignore this. Just just write the terms out like this. Now, why this is good? Well, because I can factorize out A from everything and then cancel it, right? But also, you notice when I've done that, I've grouped up these first three here because over here I've got nine lots of those first three and over here I've got one lot of them. So I'll just take away one lot of this bracket from both sides to end up with this. And now I'm going to factorize out r cubed from that. And now I can cancel. Well, I can't. I've got this times this equals this times this. So I've got a couple of choices here. 
um, either this thing is equal to this, either r cubed is equal to eight, if I just cancel this out, um, which means r is two, of course, or this thing here is equal to zero. Um, but I know this thing is never equal to zero. With that. This doesn't have any real solutions because b squared minus 4ac is negative. Um, so I can just cancel, what I'm saying is I can just cancel this because I'm not going to be dividing by zero. So r cubed must be eight, which means r is two. And then I finally use this thing here. If r is two, then I get 30, 64 times a is 360 divided by 64. I slowly cancel that fraction down and you end up with one of the answers. Excellent. Um, okay, two circles. This circle has uh, center minus four minus one, a radius of eight. So it looks a bit like this, I guess. Um, and this circle has center eight, four, radius r. Um, so it could look a bit like that, I guess. Now, apparently the circles have one point in common. Now, there are two possible cases for this, as it says. Either this circle, this, currently these circles have two points in common. Look, I could either make this smaller circle look like this. Now, remember, the smaller circle is the only one I can change because uh, I can change its radius. I can't change anything about this circle. But I could change this radius to be this, and then they meet at one point. Or I could change the radius to be that, and then again they meet at one point. And I just need to look at both cases. Let's look at the smaller one first. Um, I know the radius of this circle is 8 because of this here. Um, now I know this radius is r, again, because of because of this. Um, and now I can make I can do some Pythagoras here. The distance between minus 4 and 8 is 12. The distance between minus 1 and 4 is 5. Um, and so this is just 8 plus r squared is equal to 5 squared plus 12 squared. But maybe you just at this point recognize the, 12, the 5, 12, 13 triangle, uh, which means 8 plus r just must be 13. So if you want to do this properly, but I just recognize the 5, 12, 13 triangle, uh, which of course means r is 5. That's in the smaller case. Now in the bigger case, you've got a radius of 8 this way. It's probably the easiest way to visualize this. This radius is r all the way along there, which means this distance here is r minus 8. And then we do the same triangle thing. We've still got the distance of 12. We've still got the distance of 5. And again, this is still a 5, 12, 13 triangle, which means this is 13. Uh, and we get R is 21. A difference between smaller case and larger case is 16. Number 7. Um, okay, so I've been... I, I think I chose to be fancy here. Did I use product rule? Oh, I did. Nice. So I, I haven't bothered to expand this out. I've just used product rule. I've differentiated this one first to get minus 2x and then left this, left this the same. And then I differentiated this one to get 2q and left this the same. And now at x is minus 1, uh, let's just put in x is minus 1. So dy by dx at x is minus 1. You just put in minus 1. So this becomes a positive 2. That becomes a minus 2q. That becomes a minus 1 squared is positive 1. So it's just a minus 1. And we'll tidy this up. And we get a function in terms of q. And I want to minimize that function um, because uh, this is the gradient function. And apparently, I want to minimize the gradient at this point. This is the function at that point. So I want to minimize that. Um, well, how am I going to do that? Well, I'm just going to be, I, again, I could have just differentiated this, can I? But I chose to be fancy. Took a 4 out and then completed the square on this quadratic here. Um, just halve this number and then take away the square, if that's how you complete the square. Um, and now notice I'm not looking for the actual minimum value of the gradient. I'm looking for the value of q, which minimizes it. And the value of q that minimizes it is when you get rid of this whole term here, when q is 0.75 or 3 quarters. Um, because, of course, this thing squared is always a positive number. So if I want to make the whole thing as small as possible, I just want to get rid of this positive number here. That's the best I can do, which makes making Q 0.75 to make this 0, 0 squared is 0, and then the rest of it is that. Anyway, question number 8. Uh, a trapezium rule, then. So I have some function. Uh, maybe the function looks like this. I don't know. Um, but apparently, uh, to make an overestimate, I'll just say, uh, sorry, to make an underestimate, I'll just say, you need the graph to be convex like this. Um, so we need a convex graph to make uh, an underestimate. Now, this is obviously not what this is talking about because this is between 0 and 1, and f of x is bounded between 0 and 1. But I'm just saying I need a convex graph to make to make an underestimate. Now here, all they've done here is they've shifted the graph up by 1. right? That's all that this does. But when you shift the graph up by 1, you've still got a convex graph. right? So this is still convex. Here they've stretched the graph out north and south, but again, still convex. Here they've moved the graph left and right. I, I hope we can obviously see that that's just still going to be convex, so it's still going to be an underestimate. Here they've um, reflected the graph in the y-axis, so they've flipped over here, but that's still going to make it convex over here, right? Uh, they've changed the limit, so it's fine, um, but it's still convex. 
So by deduction, it must be this. We can argue it as well. What they've done here is they flipped the graph in the x-axis, which makes it look like this. And then they've shifted it up so it looks like this here. Like it's going to be following that, which is, of course, concave. So it's going to be this one. Number nine. Uh, so first thing I'll say is that I need to find the intersections between these graphs if I want to find the areas between them. Now they clearly intersect as zero zero because zero zero works for both um, for both uh, graphs here. Now I'm going to rewrite this one as x over p equals root y and then square both sides. And now I can look for the other intersection, which is when this is equal to this here. Um, times both sides by p squared divided by sides by root x. Root x is x to the power half, and then I take away the powers. Uh, to get one and a half, two minus half is one and a half. I'm going to square both sides here just to get rid of this two. If you imagine squaring this, I'm going to three over two times two is three. Square that for that, and then cube root, of course, and I get the other intersection is at p squared. Um, that's great then. So now I'm going to um, integrate this, take away the other one between zero and p squared because those are the two intersection points. And this is just grunt work, right? Root x is x to the power of half. Um, raise that to x power of 3 over 2, divide by 3 over 2, which is the same as timesing by 2 thirds. If we know KFC, we should be down with that. Raise that to an x to the 3, divide by 3. Put in the p here. Now, I'm, I'm being lazy here. When I put in p squared, the 2 times the 3 over 2 is just going to be 3, and then I'm going to have another p here to give me 4 p's in total. Here, this is going to give me p to the 6 if I put p squared in here, and then Divided by p squared can be p to the 4. That's just going to be a third p to the 4. Of course, when I put zeros in, I'm just going to get 0 in both cases. This is clearly a third p to the 4. Um, and so the answer is p4 over 3. Excellent. Number 10. So when you see mods, if you can, it's easier to look at the case of when x is a negative number and when x is a positive number separately, which I can do for something like integration because I can break up this integrand between minus one and zero and zero and three. And now think about what the mod function does. If the x is negative, essentially, essentially what the mod function does is if the x function is negative, it multiplies it by minus one. And if the x is positive, it does nothing, right? Because that means when you put a negative in, it becomes a positive, you multiply by minus one. And when you put a positive in, nothing happens because you've done nothing. And in either case, you get a positive number out. Now, the reason I split this integrand up is, of course, because now in this integrand here, I'm only putting in negative x values. And when I put in a negative x value into a mod, what the mod does is it multiplies it by minus 1. So I can just replace that mod function with a minus x, because that's what the function does in this area here. Now, again, like I said, when x is positive, which it strictly is in this integrand, nothing happens when you put it in a mod, so I can just get rid of it. And now, of course, this is a very simple thing for me to do. I'm just going to expand out the brackets, and I'm going to integra integrate these separately. Um, so, of course, the integral of this is this, and then I can put the terms in. Uh, I, I don't think I need to be too, too careful about this. What I would say is, if you're aiming to do the Tamura paper, um, please be extremely careful um, uh, please, uh, and practice using fractions because you're going to have to use fractions a lot and, and you really want to be good at them. Otherwise, this is going to go badly. Um, but yeah, get some pra fraction practice down um, for sure if you're aiming to do a Tamiya paper. Okay, question number 11. Uh, so the first thing I can think here is that 3 to the power 1 is x squared y. Sorry, x y squared, um, just by the definition of this. So that seems kind of helpful. I couldn't really see how to use that properly so what I instead then did was took the same equation and used the log laws. So this is log 3x plus log 3y squared, which, of course, you can move the 2 over to the front using the power law, and you get this. Now, this here, I, I just chose to rearrange to be log 3x equals minus 3 over log 3y. I just divided both sides by log 3y. Um, and then I just shoved this expression into here and then multiplied by log 3y to make myself a quadratic in log 3y. Um, and it turns out that this factorizes nicely. You, you can make a substitution here if you, you feel more comfortable, but I think I'm comfortable enough to just say, well, this factorizes this. This times this is 2 of that squared, plus 2 of them minus 3 of them gives you minus 1 of them, uh, minus 3, which, of course, means the solutions are either log 3y is minus 1, um, or uh, which, of course, means y is a third, because 3 to the power minus 1 is y, 3 to the power minus 1 is a third, or log 3y is, is 3 over 2, um, in which case 
uh, 3 to the power 3 over 2 is y. Now here I've also written down from this expression that I made at the start, well, what's the corresponding x value? Well, a third q squared is a ninth. Times both sides by 9, you get 8. x is 27, so that's fine. This one's a bit more difficult, but when you square this, imagine squaring that 3 over 2 times 2 is going to be just 3. So this is, becomes 3 to the 3. 3 to the 3 squared is 3 to the 6. Uh, sorry, oh, I've, I already did that bit, sorry. So, yeah, easier if I just write it down, isn't it? Um, and this, of course, means, well, what do you have to make x to be to make this work? Well, 3 to the power negative 2 would match these indices here. So if x is 3 to the power negative 2, um, which is a ninth, add up the x values uh, that do it, and you get 27 and a ninth. Uh, number 12, uh, this is a fairly difficult spot, but what you need to do, if you're a fan of my um, rationalizing denominators like a legend video, um, you'll have spotted this in three seconds. Um, but this is quite a difficult integral until you realize t minus 1 is a beautiful difference of two squares, and it's just root t plus 1, root t minus 1. Um, and of course, the fact that this is written the other way around doesn't matter. This is going to cancel with that. Um, and you get a very simple integral. You can move the constant out to the front because it's just a constant. Change root t to t to the power half so that's integral, so that you can integrate it easily. Um, raise the power to 3 over 2. Divide by 3 over 2, which is the same as timesing by 2 thirds. Integrate that to t. Um, and now I say, I, I've still got the plus c, of course. When you integrate, you get a plus c. Now it says when v is 7, t is 1. So I can put in v is 7 and t is 1. Of course, 1 to the power anything is 1. 2 thirds minus 1 is a, minus a third. Minus a third times 24 pi is minus 8 pi. So 7 is equal to minus 8 pi plus c. Um, and of course, c is 7 plus 8 pi. So that, going back to here, gives me my full expression for v, which is this. And now it's just says find the value when t is 9. So put in 9 into here. Uh, 9 square rooted is 3, cubed is 27. Divided by 3 is 9, times by 2 is 18. So then we get 18, take away 9, which is 9. 9 times 24 pi is 216 pi. Up them together and we get our answer. Excellent. Again, need to be consistent and good with fractions and indices here. Super important in Tamir. Okay, find the maximum value of this here. Um, can't even remember what I did here, so I'm just going to have to click across and see if I can figure it out. Uh, first, call the function this. Um, now, I've changed this, two into a t this 4 into a 2 squared. And now, think about what happens here. This multiplies by this, right? But it doesn't matter what order I do multiplication in, so I'm going to swap these two around and write it like this. And now, look here. This is essentially a quadratic. It's this thing squared minus 4 lots of this thing plus a number. So if I write it as a y function, it just becomes this. And I, I know how to deal with this kind of thing. Um, I think I can find the maximum value of this. Um, well, actually, I can't, but I'll explain that in a second. What I'm going to do is complete the square on this. So I'm going to, you know, 4 halved is 2, squared is 4. So I want a 4 over here and a, a minus 2 in here. Now, it would be very easy for me to find the minimum value of this. Like the minimum value happens when y is 2 and you get a minimum of a quarter. But that's not the question. The question is a maximum. Now, this is a quadratic, so surely it doesn't really have a maximum, except it does, because you've got to remember this substitution here. Like, what's... What are my actual values of y going to be able to be? Because, of course, sine x is a, is a function in itself. Um, now, sine of x is it can, it can only take values between minus 1 and 1, right? Imagine the graph is just stuck between minus 1 and 1, which means y, the biggest y can be is 2, because you get 2 to the power 1 is 2. The smallest y can be is when you put in minus 1 into here, and you get 2 to the minus 1, which is a half. So essentially, this does have a maximum value because I can't just put whatever I want into it. I can only put stuff in between here. And for something in here, this is going to have a, a maximum somewhere. Like, like th there's got to be some value of y in here that makes this bigger than anything else would have made it. Um, and what value is that going to be? Well, essentially, all I need to do is make this as big as possible. And to make this as big as possible, this bit here, this squared bit, I just need to make this as big as possible, which means I need the, need the biggest difference between y and 2, which is going to be when I use y as a half. So when I put a half into here, um, I'm going to get a half minus 2. That make, makes the difference between these numbers as big as possible. Square it um, for 9 over 4. Uh, of course, the negative doesn't matter. Add them together for 10 quarters, which is 5 halves. So, um, yeah, that's, that's going to be my maximum value because the range is so restricted, or, or the domain I should... Probably say, probably say, I should definitely say the domain is so restricted. 
If you don't know that word, don't worry about it. Question number 14. Um, so this is quite a difficult question as well. Um, it's a simultaneous equation. So the first thing I can think is, well, if I just times that by root 3, I get this. Of course, root 3 times root 3 is 3, um, and so on. And then I write the second one out, and I can just take these away, right? Because these match now. So take these away, and I get this. Divide by 4. Uh, this seems good, because I know that's a good value for cos. And now I, I just need to solve this, right? So I'm going to solve this for x. Of course, if I'm looking in, uh, if I've got 2x as my input here, I put a 2 here, which means doubling these inequalities, and then I can replace the 2x with the y, and I can look in this range for this answer here. Now, I know the first value because I'm good at maths. I know the first value if, if I just draw out the cos graph terribly. I deliberately draw these graphs terribly because I want to show you that it does not matter how terribly you draw graphs. Like, that's not the point. Um, but minus 3, root 3 over 2 is down here somewhere. Um, I'm just saying that this is 180, this is 360, this is 720. Minus 3 over 2 is down, root 3 over 2 is down here somewhere. The first time it happens is, well, root 3 over 2 is 30 degrees from um, the origin, which means it must, minus root 3 over 2 must be 30 degrees back from this, um, from this maximum minimum here, which means it must be at 150. Um, and likewise, it must be another 30 degrees along, which case you to 210. And then here, well, this is 540 in between 360 and 720. So 30 back from 540, 30 forward from 540 gives you these two. But of course, those are my y solutions. My original uh, substitution was y equals 2x. So I need to halve all these for my x's. And now it's tempting to stop here and go, well, those are all my answers. I'll add them up and I'll get the answer. Except when you add those up, you don't get something that's here. So you must have done something wrong. And of course, the thing that you've done wrong is you haven't really solved this simultaneous equation. Like you've eliminated one of the things that you were dealing with, the signs, and then just solved for the other. But of course, when you solve a simultaneous equation, you can, sure, you can multiply these up and solve the x's, but then you go back, right? You go back and you say, well, what was the y solution, right? You, like you need them in pairs. And now this is a bit strange, this simultaneous equation. Maybe you haven't seen something like it before because both variables are in x rather than x and y. And what that means is when you go back into here, when you, when you say, well, I know cos 2x must be this, and you put it back into here to get your corresponding sine solution, I'll, I'll just do that really quickly. I, I think I've just cancelled the root 3s here. Um, I can, obviously, that's a plus there. Uh, and I get this here. I, I get that sine 2x must be a half. What I have to then say is, well, that has this here has corresponding x solutions, right? Just like this had x solutions. This here has x solutions. But they must be the same solutions, right? Like what I did, what I decided with the first um, thing here, the first, um, what's this called? Um, when I eliminated this variable sine 2x and decided that cos 2x had to be this, I, I came up with some x values, but now I've decided that sine 2x also has to be this, right? Cos 2x, sure, has to be minus root 3 over 2. But in order for both of these equations to work, that makes sine 2x a half. You can check it in this one as well, but sine 2x must be a half. Now, if they're both variables of x, then whatever the x solutions were here, they have to also make this happen. Otherwise, the entire thing isn't satisfied. So they have to make this happen as well. So let's look for the solutions of this and see which of this list actually do make this happen as well. Well, okay, same idea, right? So you, you you extend the range out by 2, you replace it with a y maybe if you want to. I know the first solution of this is 30. Again, my terrible graph comes out. My first solution is 30 um, for a half, which means my next solution is 30 back from here, which is 150. Um, 30 forward from there is 390. 30 back from 540 is 510. Half them all, because again, I'm looking for x values, half them all like I did before. And I see that the only values that make this minus root 3 over 2 and that a half is the 75 and the 225, which I then add together for 330. But remember, you've, you've got to have them both happen. Otherwise, you're not really solving the entire line, right? You can just solve for this if you want to, but you need to solve the entire line. And since they're both variables next, you need x to be the right thing in both cases at the same time, which only happens with these two options. Uh, number 15. Uh, quite an interesting question. Going to first write 8 as 2 cubed. Now, I multiply these, right? And be careful here. This is 3 times 3 to the x, which is 3 to the x plus 1, right? Like this is 3 to the 1 times 3 to the x, 
add the indices together, 3cx plus 1. Now I think I can cross multiply out. Now 4 is 2 squared. And again, add the powers here. This is 9 to the x plus 2. And I get this. Um, and now, of course, I've got both things as a base of 2, which means this power must equal that power. And I end up with this. Now, it's not immediately obvious how to solve this. Um, you just need to think of some other area of maths that you can use. And the area that I thought of well, is, well, just like the trick I used earlier, 9 is 3 squared. Um, and I can do a couple of things here. Firstly, I did this trick earlier in the video as well. Two you multiply the powers here, which means I'm just allowed to swap the order of them because I'm still just going to multiply these out. And now I've got this thing squared minus 3 lots of the same thing plus 2 is 0. I've just moved the other thing over. And that's just a quadratic. And in fact, it's a factorizable quadratic. Um, which means 3 to the x is either 2 or 3 to the x is 1. Um, now, this has a trivial solution of 0 because 3 to the 0 is 1. It doesn't want that. Um, this has a solution of log 3, 2, which is going to be my answer. And number 16. So, thinking about this graph here, this graph is, uh, I mean, if I first look at this, if I were to shift this graph, uh, f of x plus 1 is when you shift the graph to the left. So if you also change your limits to also be 1 to the left, then it's just the same integral, right? So this is just equal to this, which is really helpful because look at this top line. I know that this thing here is just 6. Um, so I can write that out, and I can find that two lots of this first integral is minus 16, divide by 2, and you get this thing here. So just to recap that, you move this graph 1 to the left to get to this graph. So if you also move the limits one to the left, then it's just the same integral. Put that in there uh, and get this. Now, this is just the integral between 0 and 1 plus the integral between 1 and 2. But I know both of these things now. I know this one because um, it's I just worked it out as minus 8. And I know this one because the question essentially told me about this transformed graph. So that's 6. So it's minus 8 plus 6, uh, which is minus 2. Good question. Um, number 17. Uh, okay, let's first deal with this. I've got two things multiplying and they need to be greater or equal to zero. So I have two options. Either this thing is bigger than zero and that thing is bigger than zero. Two positives make a positive. Or this thing is less than zero and that thing is less than zero. Because, of course, two negatives also make a negative. Uh, sorry, also make a positive. Let's deal with this case first. Uh, let's deal with this. Of course, I can just move the half over. I can move the cos theta over. I'm obviously going to draw this. Now, Sine of 2 theta between 0 and pi essentially looks like the regular sine graph um, because it's half the regular interval, but it's got twice as big a, uh, twice as short a period. So that just looks like the regular sine graph. And now I know that sine of a half happens, sorry, I know that sine equals a half of pi over 6. So sine of 2 theta must equal a half of pi over 12. Um, because, of course, pi over 12 times 2 is pi over 6, and that equals a half. So I know that's pi over 12. By symmetry, um, if it's pi over 12 on from 0, it must be pi over 12 back um, from this value, which is pi over 2, uh, which gives me 5 pi over 12. Pi over 2, I guess, is 6 pi over 12 minus the pi over 12 distance here to get 5 pi over 12. And so my range for sine 2 theta being bigger than a half is in between 5 pi over 12 and pi over 12. Now, what about this here? Well, if I draw the regular sine graph, the regular sine graph between 0 and pi looks like this. Beautiful curve, that one. Very proud of that one. Uh, cos between 0 and pi looks like this. Again, exceptional curve. I know those two things meet at pi over 4, um, because if you just divide, I guess, both sides by cos, you get tan theta as 1, and I know that happens at pi over 4. Um, so, of course, this value is pi over 4. I want sine to be bigger than cos, which means I have to be bigger than pi over 4. And now I just need to compare these two intervals and say they both have to happen at the same time, which of course means that the lower, the higher lower range is pi over 4. I just need to be between pi over 4 and um, 5 pi over 12. Right? So you take the bigger lower bound and the higher upper bound, but it's the only upper bound, so that's fine. Um, okay, what about this one? Well, this is pretty much the same thing, right? It's just the opposite values. So instead of, for, so for sine 2 theta less than half, you're just going to get pi is less than pi over, sorry, theta is less than pi over 12, or theta is bigger than pi over 12. Um, and for sine theta being less, you're just going to get less than pi over 4. And again, you just compare these inequalities here, which ones match when. Well, this is completely irrelevant now, because I have to be less than pi over 4. 
Um, but less than pi over 4 doesn't really mean anything because I have to be less than pi over 12. So the only way that any of this happens is at pi over 12. And now it's saying the fraction of the interval between 0 and pi that, these, that this works. Well, I can either be this, which, well, if I multiply this one up here, I get 3 pi over 12. So there's essentially 2 pi is over 12 that I can be in within here. And there's 1 pi over 12 section that I can be in here, which gives me a total of 3 pi over 12 sections I could be in which is a quarter of pi. Um, so that's a bit weird, I guess. Uh, I don't know whether you followed that. That was, I should have written this down more clearly, I think. There are two pi over 12. If you split pi into twelfths, two of them are in this bound and one of them are in this bound. So I have three of the regions in total, three of the twelfths, uh, which means it's a quarter of the entire thing because three twelfths is a quarter. Okay, number 18. Now, I find the shortest system with that and that. I'm going to draw it, obviously, because I'm drawing everything. Uh, this is this graph uh, has a y-intercept of 4, I guess, if that's going to be helpful. I'm not sure. Here's this graph. has a, It's just a straight line uh, with a y-intercept of minus 2 this time. And I'm looking for the shortest distance. Now, the shortest distance is going to give me right angles, right? It's got to be perpendicular to the, to the lines. I think it was um, Euclid who proved that a long time ago in his book Elements. But we're just going to take for granted that we're going to use parallel lines to... Uh, uh, the meet, perpendicular lines that meet at 90. Now, the gradient of this um, purple line here must be minus half because it's minus 1 over the gradient of the, its perpendicular line. So the gradient of that is minus a half. And now what I'm essentially saying is that if this is also perpendicular to this red curve momentarily at this point, then the red curve must also have gradient of 2. So let's differentiate this red curve um, essentially what I'm saying is I, I want this red curve to have this gradient at that point exactly. But I, essentially I want the gradient of this red curve to be 2, differentiate of 2x, and I want this gradient to be 2, which means of course I need x to be 1. So I need this x value to be 1, put that into here to find the y value, 1 squared plus 4 is 5, and I know this point must be 1, 5. Because that's the point, that's the x coordinate that gives me a gradient of 1 on this red curve, and that's just the y coordinate that I get corresponding. So that point is 1, 5. Now I can do something good. I can say, well, this purple line, this one connecting the two closest points, has gradient minus half and goes through 1, 5. So let's fill that in. Uh, goes through 5, goes through 1, and I can find my C value. And so I know the equation of this purple line is this. And now I can say, well, to find this point here, I can just find the intersection between the purple and the black line. So I'll set them equal to each other. I'll solve this. Uh, times everything by 2, I guess. Yeah, nice, nice shout. Divide by 5. And I get an x coordinate here of 3, which gives me a corresponding y value of 4. 2 times 3 minus 2 is 4. And now all I have to do is find the distance between these two closest points, um, which of course just makes a triangle. Uh, distance 2, distance 1. We did this earlier with the circles. But a Pythagoras tells me that this distance here is 1 squared plus 2 squared rooted, which is root 5. Great question. Number 19. I've actually done this in two ways. I did it the way that I originally thought to do it, and then I realized maybe there was a more... Uh, my way is very hand-wavy, so I thought maybe I should show another more, maybe more clear way. What I said here was that this is essentially sine 10 plus sine 100, you know, when you use k as... When, this is when you use k as 0, then you use k as 1, and you get 100, then you use k as 2, and you get this, all the way up to when you use k as 90, which is when you get that. Now let's investigate this a little bit. Here's my sign just repeating over and over. Now sine of 10, uh, I guess the speaker's at 90, this is at 180, this is at 360 and so on. Um, sine of 10 is the same. So you're just a little bit on from, from, from this point here. It's actually the same as sine of 190 because 190 is 10 degrees on from, from this intersection here. And you're gonna get a corresponding negative output as your positive output when you put in 10 because of the symmetry of the sine graph, right? So what I'm saying there is 190, which is about here, gives you a corresponding negative output as sine of 10 does here. So this must cancel with that. And for much the same reason, sine of 100, which is just on from 90 up here somewhere near one, gives you a corresponding um, output with sine of 280. 280 is, this peak is at 270. So 280 is just beyond that peak. So it's the same negative value as your positive value from 100. So this will cancel with that. Um, and this will continue. Like notice how sine of 370, 
must be the same as sine of 10, right? Because I've just added 360 to this. So all of the next four terms are just 360 above these, which means they all cancel with each other as well. And I'm going to cancel terms in blocks of four, right? This with that, this with that, and then you cancel them in blocks of four. Now, be careful here. I start at k is zero and I end up k is 90. So I actually have 91 terms, which means if I'm going to cancel them in blocks of four, the first 88, since 88 is a multiple of four, will cancel perfectly with each other. And I'll be left with the last three terms, the 89th, the 90th, and the 91st term. Which again, that's because you're starting at k is zero, you have 91 terms to put in. So I'm going to just be left with the last three terms. But think about these last three terms here. Just like we saw here, the first, after you've got through a batch of four, the next one is the same as the first one, the very first one was. So this is the same as that, which of course makes this the same as that, and this the same as that. But we know that this cancels with this, so this must cancel with that, and we're left with this, which I know must be this. So the answer is sine 100. So that was my very hand wavy way of doing it. That's how I thought about it the first time. If you understood that, great. Um, thinking like that is, is probably quite helpful. Uh, probably a more uh, precise way of doing the question, I thought, was to use um, a bit of um, compound rule and also uh, knowing uh, using a bit of rules to do with sums of sequences. So I'm going to break this sign up into this because I can use the sign uh, compound formula here. And now when you have two things adding, in a sum, you can split that sum across both of them. And now, of course, sine 10 is just a constant and cos 10 is just a constant. So I'll bring those out to the front and I get this. And now something interesting is going to happen here, which is when you put in whole numbers into here, I'm going to get cos of 0 first when I put in k as 0, then I'm going to get cos of 90, then cos of 180, then cos of 270, then cos of 360, and so on. But the nice thing about that is that both cos and sine have very... Um, nice repeating things when you put in 0, 90, 180, 270 into them, right? Um, I am not sure why I just wrote that thing out again identically. But anyway, um, cos of 90, k, when k starts at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, is 1, cos of 0 is 1, cos of 90 is 0, cos of 180 is minus 1, cos of 270 is 0, and then cos of 360, when k is 4, goes back to 1. So it repeats through these four values, and sine does a very similar thing. Sine of 0 is 0, sine of 90 is 1, sine of 180 is 0, and so on. And now what does this mean? Well, again, we have this whole thing where they cancel in 4s, right? Notice how the first four terms of cos, when you add them up, of, of this sequence of cos, when you add them up, will cancel. Again, I've got 91 terms here, which means the first 88 will cancel beautifully, and I'll be left with the last three. But look at the last three. The last three are just going to be this, this, and this. And they happen to cancel as well. So all of this is just going to go away like all of it. And I'll be left with this thing. Now, what does sine do? Well, that goes 0, 1, 0, minus 1. Again, I have 91 terms to put into this, and they're cancelling groups of 4, which means the first 88 cancel perfectly, and I'll be left with the last 3, which are going to be the repeat of the first 3, which actually means when you add up the last 3, you're going to get a 1. So this all adds up to 1, this whole sum here, which means I'm just going to be left with a cos of 10. Now, unfortunately, that's not any of the answers, but I can fix that. Um, by using the relationship between sine and cos, which is this here. Now, to get cos of 10, I need to use x as 80. So therefore, cos of 10 is sine of 80, which, again, isn't an answer here. But I can, again, use the symmetry of sine. Co sine of 80, just, just back from 90, must be the same as sine of 100, just forward from 90, using some symmetry. So sine of 80 is the same as sine of 100, and the answer is sine of 100 again. If you prefer the second method, great. Uh, question number 20. Um, What's the complete range of values for which this uh, intersect at three points and two? Okay, let's just draw these. So if I get out an axis, um, I can factorize this out first, and I can notice that this is a lovely difference of two squares, uh, and that means that it has solutions or roots at zero, a 12, uh, sorry, root 12, and minus root 12. So my red graph looks a bit like this, um, cubic like this. Now this one, I'm just going to be a bit sneaky and write like this instead, because what I want to show here is that this graph is essentially just this graph moved up by k, translated up k units, you know, thinking about graph transformations. Now what does this first bit look like? Well, that's just a regular x squared graph shifted two to the right. So a regular x squared graph shifted two to the right and then flipped in the y-axis. 
sorry, in the x-axis, I should say. So it's down like this. So just that first bit of it looks like this, just the first bit. And now what happens when you add a k, uh, and maybe I should say at this point that um, this point here is 2 because the root is at 2. And this point here, when you put in x is 0, you get 0 minus 2 is minus 2, squared is minus 4, sorry, it's positive 4, with a minus makes minus 4. Right. And now what happens when you put in a k, when you add k? Well, the graph shifts up or down, doesn't it? And now think what this is asking me to do. It's asking me to have um, two. I, I, so, so right now, I guess I could say plus zero. I could say k. This is just the case when k is zero. Now, the graph, the, the question wants me to have three intersection points. Now, what I, firstly, what I'll say is that the x cubed graph is getting negative much faster than the x squared graph. So this will always catch up with this somewhere down below the screen somewhere. So I'm going to have a negative solution over here. Right now I've got two positive solutions. So k is 0 is a case that they're interested in. Because right now I've just essentially drawn it with k being 0. Now what else can I make k? And remember, all that making k a number here does is move the graph um, up or down. Like all, all, all changing k does is move the graph up or down, exactly up and down like so. Now, I notice right now it's at k is minus 4. The y-axis is at k is minus 4. If I move this graph up by more than 4 units, like so, I'm not going to have two intersections over on the positive end of the x of the axis. right? So I already know that my lower bound for k, k must be at 4. I can't make k bigger than 4 because um, if k is bigger than 4, I end up with something that looks like this, and that's not going to have two solutions over here. So when I'm looking at my answers here, I know it must be either this one, um, sorry, either this one because k is less than 4, or this one because k is less than 4. Now, I don't know what the lower bound is yet, but I know my upper bound for k. I can't make it bigger than 4. If I make it bigger than 4, the graph goes up like this, and there's no two solutions on the right-hand side of the graph there. So k must be less than 4. Now, how low can I make k? How much can I shift it down? Well, at some point, of course, I'm going to move this graph down far enough such that I'm not going to have intersections on this side. So there must be some value that is too much for me to move k down. And I just need to find out what the value is. Um, so let's just uh, figure it out by differentiating this graph here. I wasn't really sure what to do, so I just thought differentiating would be a good idea. And my aim is to find the turning point of the red graph down in the, uh, essentially, uh, oh, went too far. My aim was to kind of find the, the point of this turning point. And it turns out that doing that is really helpful because when you differentiate, you get this. When you solve that for zero, of course, move the 12 over divided by three to get four. Root four is plus or minus two. And what you learn, therefore, is that this minimum point at x is two lines up perfectly with the maximum point of this graph here. Right, like they're exactly in line, which is really, really helpful because if I just knew the y coordinate of this, which I do, right, the y coordinate of this, I can just find out when x is 2, um, put, in, put that into here to find the y coordinate being minus 16. So this here is at 2 minus 16, which means when I'm thinking about moving this graph down, the furthest I can move it down to still have two solutions, I can move it 16 down, right? If I move it 16 down, well, I can't move it 16 down. That just gives me one solution. They just meet a tangent. But just less than 16 down, and I get two solutions. So the most I can move it down is 16. The most I can move it up is, is 4, as discussed before. And so that's my range there. And that's the end of the paper. Really well done for sticking through that.